Jay Mintzmeyer is a renowned maritime shipping analyst who directs the Value Investors Edge research platform on Seeking Alpha. He is a frequent speaker at industry conferences, is regularly quoted in trade journals, and hosts a popular podcast featuring shipping industry executives. Mr. Mintzmeyer also hosts regular virtual investor forums, which are a must attend for anyone interested in the shipping and infrastructure industries. Jay, thanks so much for being here. The floor is yours. Hey, thank you so much for that introduction. It's great to be back with Money Show. It's been a few months. I think the last one was in December. So it's great to be back with everyone. Thanks for tuning in this morning. So a little bit about myself before we get started. Uh, I'm the head of research at a boutique research uh, shop called Value Investors Edge. We're on Seeking Alpha. You can follow me for free on Twitter at Mintzmeyer. I do industry updates and some trade stuff and, and everything there. We also have two week of research free trials available for today and tomorrow. That's at Mintzmeyer.com. It'll take you straight to our landing page and you'll learn more about our platform and how that works. So real quick, before we get started, I want to do a previous performance review, talk about the last time we've been on Money Show and, and how our picks have done since then. One thing I do every time is I do an industry update, talk about the shipping sector, and then we share some of our favorites, our top picks in the area. So the first time I was on Money Show was in August of 2020, and we talked about an outsized return potential in maritime shipping. The average return of those five picks was 38.5% in four months. You say, Jay, why is that four months? Well, four months was until the next time I came on Money Show and, and talked about the new picks. So we outperformed the S&P by 26% at that time. We came on December 38.8 uh, in four months, back in April 2021 with a new theme, 16.2 in three and a half months. Then we came back to last summer, uh, July 21, uh, maritime shipping. We said it was the hottest sector for 21 and 22. It was 36.8% in three months. And keep in mind, these returns are not per year. They're just from you know three to four months, each money show to each money show. Then October, we came on. And this was the first time uh, where the sequence in seven weeks was negative. It was negative 0.9%, about 1%. We outperformed by 6% there. And then last December, we said, you know, we're, you're going to outperform in 2022 with maritime shipping. A lot of fours there, 44.4%. <laughs> that was as of last night. It's actually about 30, uh, actually about 47% if you look currently right now. That outperformed the S&P by 50%. So past performance, of course, is no guarantee of the future results. But if you take all those together and you just think about, you know, hypothetically, theoretical, money show to money show, looking at the top picks, how they did, you, you, you got on money show, you saw the top picks, and then once you got on the next one, you sold the old ones, bought the new ones. The cumulative outperformance in under two years is 224% over the S&P 500. I, you know, again, past performance doesn't guarantee any future results, but hopefully you're excited. Hopefully you're like, shut up, Jay. Don't tell me anything more about the industry. Let's just get into those topics. But uh, I got to do my due diligence. I got to talk about what we do and I got to talk about the industry, but we will have some top picks for you. So stay tuned there until the end. We'll also save about maybe five minutes or so for Q&A. So if you have any questions, just throw those into the uh, chat board and I'll be happy to get to those. If we run out of time, I can hopefully address some of those on Twitter as well. I'm happy to engage with anyone who has thoughtful questions. So what we're gonna do today is we're gonna talk about our shop, our, our research group and how we operate. We're gonna do a quick market review. We're gonna talk about what 2020 looked like, 21, 22. We're gonna talk about the three, what I think are the three most interesting and attractive sectors. That's container ships, dry bulk and tankers. And then we'll review those topics and, and do some Q&A. So what do we do? We focus exclusively in our lane, which is maritime shipping, supply chain, and the related energy infrastructure. So anything that's transported across the oceans, we're focused on it, we're involved in it. Our team has specialties. For example, James Catlin, exclusively on macro. Michael Boyd, exclusively on the energy and infrastructure there. And then Clement Mullins, exclusively in shipping. So we're very focused on our lane. You won't see us talking about biotech or Tesla or anything like that. So in 2021, this is an example of our model por uh, portfolio performance, how we did on Valley Investors Edge. And these are model portfolios. They're long only, easy to follow. They're updated once a month. No options, no leverage, nothing crazy. Uh, our speculative model in 21 returned 190.8% and our risk reward was 81.7. So that's a lot, less, uh, lot less volatility in that portfolio. And then this is what it looks like on a graph. You say, yeah, Jay, okay, you guys did good last year, but that's because shipping did well. Well, you, you know, shipping did have a good year. That's what this pink line shows, the average of all shipping stocks. But you can see our model portfolios, long only, no leverage, no options, a significant alpha above the industry and, and wildly above the uh, Russell 2000. 2022 has been similar so far. Again, long only, no options, no leverage. The model, the speculative model is 44.3. And that's of last night. 
Today's actually a decent day in shipping, so it's a little higher. And then risk reward is 40.9. And this is what it looks like on a chart. So, you know, shipping has had a good year, indeed, not taking that away at all. But you can see alpha generated throughout the year and significant outperformance of the broad market. And this is what it looks like on a seven year track. Uh, you can see Value Investors Edge on the left here, the two indices in the middle, and the shipping industry on the right. Because sometimes I hear people say, well, yeah, you know, you've done a great job, you know, picking stocks, but you're lucky because shipping is a hot sector. And uh, not really, not in the last seven years, it has not been on average a hot sector, 5% returns. Uh, our average is 47. Now, you know, past performance, again, doesn't guarantee future results, but that's our uh, team's performance. And I'm very proud of that and happy to share that with you today. So let's talk about the market and what are some of the catalysts and stuff that we're looking at right now. So quick review of how we got here. If you've seen the money show before, you've probably heard this story, but 2020 COVID destroyed, decimated all the shipping stocks. The common sense was you don't wanna buy shipping during a global pandemic. Now, common sense is almost always wrong in the shipping markets, which is one of the reasons why we were able to profit and make so much money here. Because usually the common sense, the common narrative is usually incorrect. So all the shipping stocks crashed back in March when everything crashed. But remember what happened in April and May, right? The stocks started recovering. A lot of retail money came into the sector. Nobody was buying shipping. There was really no recovery trade. All these stocks were flat. They crashed in March and they were basically flat until October. At the same time, all the rates, all the free cash flows, the performance was resilient. So you had this huge disconnect where these companies were doing really, really well, but the stocks were in the gutter. As of mid-December 2020, and I have that as reference point because it was, it was actually a money show presentation, only four of those 55 names we tracked in 2020 were positive. 93% of the stocks were losers. So 2020, setting the table for what, what's been happening recently. In 21, we had that major shipping recovery. You've already seen the model portfolio. You see how, how that one went. 35 of 53 were positive in 21. 66% were winners. And then ongoing in 2022, um, we, we're having war in Ukraine, we're having disruptions across the board, we're having surging inflation. So all sorts of things are happening. And a lot of our shipping companies are actually benefiting uh, from these different disruptions. The balance sheets have never been stronger in the industry. And the majority of firms are gearing up for shareholder returns, whether that's dividends, repurchases. We've really, really turned the corner on all these companies and on a risk reward basis. Right? I'm not saying we're going to have five baggers or anything like that from here, but on a risk reward, how much, you know, what's the bear case, right? The balance sheet is strong. Bankruptcy, of course, is like totally off the table. What is the risk versus what is the reward? Our top picks and our model portfolios, I, I believe they still look very, very attractive. So let's talk a little bit about some of the tailwinds for shipping, why I like it, why we like it. We'll also talk about the headwinds, things to watch out for and, and things you might be concerned about. So first of all, on the tailwinds, there's surging cash flows and shareholder returns. We talked about that a little bit. The average balance sheet, never been stronger. And we expect significant dividends and repurchases across the industry. We're already seeing that. Basically, every dry bulk firm pays out a massive dividend. We've seen all the container ship firms ramp up their dividends. Uh, Denaus Corp had a 50% dividend increase. Uh, Global Ship Lease, 50% dividend increase. MPC, Containers, and Oslo is a massive dividend payer. Uh, we expect that to continue throughout the year. Secondly, we're well positioned for inflation. This shipping is, is arguably one of the best places you can be because the rates the daily rates and the vessel valuations all rise with inflation. Ships are basically just floating chunks of steel, right? So think about where you want to be when inflation goes up, you want to own commodities, you want to own real assets. Meanwhile, if you have fixed cost debt and almost all the companies we follow have either swap their debt or have fixed cost debt, those debts go down in real value. So you have the assets and rates going up, you have your debts going down, you have this potential for really exponential gains in net asset value and earnings per share. And we saw that in container ships the last couple of years. And, and maybe the next cycle, we might see that in tankers or dry bulk. A very, very exciting time to be in shipping. And then more recently, we had the potential for a China reopening and some stimulus. China has been playing defense with us for two years here. And they have the zero COVID policy, but it's not just COVID. They have heavy handed environmental policies. They did a lot of cleanup and stuff around the Olympics. They've had some energy crisis problems. They've been working with the real estate sector, some self-imposed uh, rules with real estate development. So that's all defensive. It, it slows the economy down. It creates friction. So if China flips that over and plays offense with their economy, they start pumping in infrastructure uh, stimulus, consumer spending stimulus, development housing stimulus. Uh, we can see a significant turnaround in that economy, something we haven't seen in a couple of years. That's really exciting for stuff like dry bulk or tankers. And then finally, we have these upcoming environmental regulations, which are going to slow the global fleet significantly. Uh, it's called EEXI and EEDI. Those are the two sets of standards, and those start next January. 
It's really just about eight months away. That's going to significantly reduce the supply because it's going to make the older ships go slower. So if you think about ships going slower, it takes longer to go from port to port. So even though you're not actually removing ships, you're making them go slower. So it's pretty bullish if you're a, if you're a ship owner. Let's talk about some of the headwinds. I want to make sure we're staying balanced here. Number one is the risk of a slowing global economy. Shipping performance, generally, it's correlated with GDP growth. Now, it's not a one-to-one, -one, right? You have to look at the supply side. You have to look at the fleet dynamics. You have to look at special situations. You have to look at disruptions. But if we have a global recession, there's really no way around that. That is bad for shipping. Of a full, I'm not just saying a little bit of slowdown. Slowdown is fine. We can navigate that. We've done it in the past. A full global recession would be bad. So if we have any risk of that, or if you're nervous about that, shipping might not be the place for you or... You want to look at the firms that have long-term contracts. Stay away from the stuff that's doing 60-day, 90-day voyages and look at the firms that have fixed things for three, four, five, six years. That's the place you want to be at this point in the cycle, if that's your concern. Another risk is the impacts of inflation and consumers shifting from what we call experiences to stuff. Um, because, because over the last couple of years, we've all been locked down, right? So a lot of folks have not been traveling as much. They've been buying more consumer goods, that sort of environment. So we expect, the value investors edge, we expect lower consumer spending in fiscal 22 than we saw in 20 and 21. We expect consumer spending in the United States in real terms will go down this year. We have less government stimulus. We have lower consumer buying power as a mixture of inflation and, and fuel costs eating away at that discretionary budget. We also expect to see more folks spending on things like travel, uh, restaurants, uh, excursions, those sort of things, a little bit less spending on, I guess you could just say stuff. You know, Walmart, Amazon, that sort of stuff. So that's generally bearish for containers and bullish for tankers, uh, the impacts there. And, and that's a reminder that shipping is not one huge monolith. Uh, I think that's a misconception a lot of folks have. Shipping is actually six or seven different subsegments. So anytime you have a positive or negative impact, you have to dive down a little bit deeper and say, well, you know, yeah, okay, but what does that mean for tankers? What does that mean for bulkers? What does that mean for containers? Um, the third issue here, or something that we're watching, is the conflict in Ukraine. Now, I got to be careful with my word choice, but disruptions generally in shipping are bullish. So the current environment, what's happened with the oil tankers, what's happened with the dry bulk markets, with the grains, with the coal, that's been actually bullish for ship owners. However, it should go without saying, but any sort of World War III scenario, NATO getting involved uh, is bearish. So that, that Russia situation is, is very much on the line. It's something we're watching very closely going forward. So that's the kind of the broad picture view. And I want to talk a little bit about the sectors and our top picks in those sectors. We'll talk about container ships, dry bulk, and tankers. So for container ships, it's a continuation of the story we've had for the last couple of years with logistics bottlenecks. We also have a couple special mid-year catalysts that are going on. So the last couple of years, we had global demand, which far exceeded global tonnage. The container ship fleet was underinvested for more than a decade. The ports were not modernized, especially in the United States, as fast as they should have. And it takes about two and a half to three and a half years to build new container ships. So by the time late 2020, when folks realized that we didn't have enough ships, it was too late. They, were, they started to order them, but those ships aren't going to arrive until middle of 23, until mid to late 2024. On top of that, we've had additional disruptions that keep carrying us forward. We've had the Ukraine situation, which has shut down all the Ukrainian airspace, all the Russian airspace cut off a lot of air traffic and air freight markets across Asia, across Europe. And a big rail line that connected China to Europe that went through Russia that has been shut down. Uh, there's all sorts of things that are going on that are increasing the global congestion rates. At, at a point in time, seasonally, when we'd expect congestion to go down, congestion in, in Europe has been moderating. It's been staying higher than we would have otherwise expected. We're also seeing stuff like this recent China zero COVID shutdown. That's causing a delay in manufacturing output. It's causing Chinese ports to become less efficient, less effective. So yes, maybe the congestion is getting better in LA and Long Beach, but just shifting around the world to other places. We have two big upcoming catalysts, one within a few weeks and one in June. The first one is China reopening. Now, I don't know if this is going to be in two weeks or two months, exactly the time frame of this, but eventually China is going to reopen. All those manufacturing outputs are going to hit the market. We're seeing all these ports shoving all the goods over to Europe, over to the United States. We've seen it happen three times now. We saw it initially with COVID. We saw it with Delta. We saw it with Omicron. We're about to see it again. It's happened every single time the exact same way. You have this huge surge of freight that comes across the ocean and slams the United States West Coast ports who are incapable of handling that sort of chunk all at once. We've seen it happen 
three times now. It'll happen again the same way. Finally, the union negotiations. The ILWU is the union that represents all U.S. West Coast ports. So LA, Long Beach, Oakland, Seattle, Tacoma. That contract expires June 30th. It's a seven-year contract. Every time that contract's come up for expiration, there's always been heavy-handed negotiations, as with you know, any union contract. This union's never had more power. Economically, it should go without saying, right? The, the liners have peak profitability, shippers have profitability. Politically, there's so much focus on the supply chain. And most of the political pressure is focusing on the liners, is focusing on some of the freight forwarders. There's not a lot of like anti-political pressure against the unions. And we have a president who's very union friendly. And I'm, I'm not making a values judgment if that's right or wrong. Just saying we have a president who's very union supportive. So this union contract in June 30th is going to be a massive catalyst. And not a lot of people are even really talking about that yet. So that's something I, I'd look forward to. Our top pick in containers. I do have the caveat. We're going to share top picks today. I already showed you uh, performance of those in the past. But I have long positions in many of these. We, are, we also actively trade when there's a lot of volatility. There is a lot of volatility in shipping over the last couple of weeks and couple of months. So positions may change in the future. That's a, so I'm long at the moment. I just want to let you know, right? I eat my own cooking. Uh, but if you come back in two, three, four weeks and the stock's up $20 a share, uh, my positions may have changed. I mean, that should be obvious, but uh, just a caveat. Uh, our top pick is Zim Integrated Shipping, Z-I-M. Now that traded really low last week. It traded about $56 a share. I think today it's doing a little better. I think it's about 59 right now as we're talking. Um, let's talk about how cheap this stock is. So they just paid out a huge dividend, a $17 dividend to shareholders. And that's based on 50% of profits from last year. And we estimate Q1 results are not out yet. They'll be out in about three weeks. We estimate there's about 20 to $25 in net cash on the balance sheet as of the end of quarter one. We're going to find out officially three to four weeks. And Zim's guidance, which I, I believe was somewhat conservative, is looking for upper 30s in earnings per share during 2022. Now, I believe they're going to do somewhere, my estimate as of today, around $40 per share in 2022. If that union negotiation doesn't go well, or if there's any increase in congestion during, during the summer, uh, those earnings could go as high as 50, maybe even higher. So if you look at that $20 you know, in net cash, 20 to 25, and you look at 40 to 50, you know, in earnings, just that number alone, you're getting mid 60s, mid 70s on that alone. And the stock is like 59. So it's extremely cheap or very bullish on that. end. We'll talk a little bit why I believe it's so cheap and, and some of the uh, misinterpretations there. So on the liner industry, there's been a lot of strong consolidation trends, improved discipline across the liners. The top five container ship liners now control 65% of the market, basically two thirds. The top 10 container liners control 85% of the market. You can see Zim down here. They have about 2%. They're the uh, number 10 liner uh, globally. Ship leasing rates. This is what ship owners like the Nowis Corp and Global Ship Lease, and, and we have investment positions in some of those as well. This is what they're getting to, to lease out their ships. Now, this is an index, but it represents the one-year leasing cost. Most of the leases are actually four to five years long, but you can see basically all-time record highs the last couple of weeks, even higher than last fall. This was when all the headlines were talking about supply chain crisis. The market for ships is actually even stronger today. I think that's something that, that it, it, a lot of folks have missed. And also, and I think this is imperative to something like Zim, there's been a mixed narrative, and I think an incorrect narrative in most of the mainstream media. Uh, we've been hearing a lot of these headlines talking about supply chain easing. We've been hearing these headlines called freight recession going on. And so the freight recession, first of all, is it Greg Fuller of uh, Freight Waves, CEO of Freight Waves, great guy, great news organization. He is looking at the massively fragmented U.S. trucking market. I just showed you how the top 10 liner companies control 85% of ocean freight. The top five alone control two thirds. And the U.S. trucking market is completely different, wild west out there. In February alone, according to Freight Waves, there was about 40,000 new companies opened in February. And you say 40,000 companies, like how is that possible? Well, most of those are just like an LLC, right? With one truck, or maybe a guy has two or three trucks. So most of those companies are just some guy with like three trucks. And there's 40,000 guys with three trucks that hit the market in February. So it's massively fragmented, uh, lowest common denominator, not gonna last very long, quick booms and busts. And that's how US trucking market has been for decades. Every couple of years, the boom and a bust, the boom and a bust. So when you see people say freight recession, they're, they're talking specifically about that trucking. And it's a niche trucking market even, 
Uh, J.B. Hunt, uh, a huge uh, logistics company in the United States, reported earnings last night, and, and they're doing just fine. So it's not even the big truckers. It's the little small guys that came in the last minute and, and got stuck with bad cargoes. Um, the reality on the ocean freight side is everything is highly seasonal. Every year, the freight rates peak, July, August, September, October, as people are rushing into the holiday season. Every year, January, February, March, April, those freight rates come down because you've already had the holidays, you have a seasonal lull, that they have the a Lunar New Year in China where manufacturing output slows. It happens every single year. So when you say supply chain is easing and you're looking at October to April, uh, it's just nonsense. I mean, seasonality happens every single year. And then finally, we talked a little bit earlier about this, but the congestion has shifted. It's shifted here from blue, this is year to date, from LA Long Beach, right? The headlines we saw last year, that congestion has came off a good amount. And that's good. We would expect that. We would want that to come off at this point in time of the year. But what's not good for the U.S. supply chain is the East Coast. The East Coast congestion has increased notably as ships are saying, we don't want to deal with L.A. They're too slow. So we're going to go to Savannah. We're going to go to Charleston. Well, oops, you screwed that one up. Now the East Coast is jammed up. And then finally, the ports of Shanghai and Ningua are, are shut down because of COVID. And this just happened a couple of weeks ago. But you can see this gray line where the congestion in China is building. And this is as of early April, I believe now it's probably a little bit more of 50, 60% congestion on this gray line. So you can see we've swapped one side of the picture of congestion for the other two sides. And, and so you'll hear, you know, supply chain easing. And it's like, well, like what exactly, are you looking at this holistically or are you looking at like one port? So that's, that's something that worth, uh, worth noting. And then finally, here's a chart that shows, shows freight rates. This is the last two years. Now this is what we have year to date. You can see freight rates are down maybe like 10%, 5% year to date. They're down about maybe 20, 25% from the all-time peaks of last fall. Again, seasonality. Every year it happens like this. The uh, January through April is very flat, very moderate, not a lot going on there. This red X is what happened last year. Last year, supply chains were not in a great position at all. And here we are, we're up $9,000 per FEU per 40 foot equivalent unit. Here we are a year ago, we're 4,500. So we've doubled year over year and look, flat from January through basically early May. And then right around the middle of May, we started running off like a rocket. And why is that? Well, first of all, season, uh, congestion started picking up around May. And second of all, that's regular seasonality. Happens every single year, it's happened for decades. You talk to anybody in ocean freight logistics, if they don't understand that, then they're not in ocean freight, they're in something else, right? They're maybe in the railroads or something. And so you can, I'm not saying this is gonna happen exactly the same this year. I'm not saying we're going to go from 10 to 20, you know, just follow the charts. However, I'm telling you, seasonality every year, it is the strongest in July through about October. It is the weakest in February through April. Remember I said we have China reopening. So China's going to reopen over here. We also have the ILWU contract that ends June 30th. So get your popcorn out, fasten your seatbelts. We're definitely not done with supply chain stuff. So we spent a lot of time on supply chain. You can tell that's the segment that has been the most interesting and, and folks want to talk about the most. We'll hit dry bulk and tankers a little faster so we can get to Q&A. But dry bulk, big picture, it's a global reopening infrastructure play. It heavily depends on China. So if you're bearish China, you probably don't like dry bulk. If you kind of have more of our house view that China has been playing defense and they're going to start playing offense, then dry bulk becomes a little bit more interesting. The best part about dry bulk is it has the lowest order book in modern history. The folks have not invested in new tonnage. So it only takes a couple percent of growth. Doesn't, you don't need strong growth in dry bulk to get strong rates. Even, even stagnant growth will probably hold decent rates for you. Our top pick in dry bulk is US, listed, US headquartered Genco Shipping, G and K. Here's a couple other firms to consider. Here's the Baltic Dry Index. This is a five-year chart. It shows the transport rates for grains, coal, iron ore, those kind of ships. This has nothing to do with container freight completely different market. So folks have been like, oh, look, shipping rates are crashing. Okay, first of all, it's seasonal. It happens every single year. Every November, December, the rates peak. Every March, uh, February, March, the rates crash. Happened here, 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 here. Every year for five years, seasonal. I think of the last 20 years, of 19 to 20 years, it has crashed from the end of the year to the beginning of the year. Every time, seasonal, it's easy to predict. And it's just based on all sorts of global trends, mainly China, uh, Lunar New Year, big holidays, big slowdowns, happens every year in February. So this right here was the seasonality. This was the Ukraine disruptions that's rerouting a lot of that coal and grains. And this is China shutting back down for zero COVID. That's what's happening in this chart here. I can't you know, guarantee anything, but I think when we go over here to late 22, I think it's gonna look a lot like this. 
regular seasonality is going to come back in. Balances are very tight. Tankers, ongoing global recovery play. They were decimated by COVID-19, the worst possible place to be. We had the demand falling apart and OPEC was pushing less oil out. So you're getting squeezed on both sides, a bad place to be. Those air traffic markets are recovering. We think consumers are going to shift more into travel, and that's really going to help at the margins with jet fuel. Jet fuel is that final piece of the puzzle that hasn't fully recovered yet. And then we have some great slides on this. We're going to show you how the Russia-Ukraine conflict is causing some disruptions and inefficiencies. And then finally, we have the oldest fleet balance in modern history combined with all sorts of upcoming regulations. So our top pick in tankers is International Seaways, U.S. headquartered, U.S. listed. Here's some other uh, tanker firms to consider. So this is a slide from Euronav. We borrowed this from them. This shows where the Russian oil was going before Ukraine. You see about 300,000 barrels going to the United States. You see about uh, 2.5 million barrels that are going to Europe. Some of that from ships and then about 800,000 pipelines. And you see about 1.7 million barrels going over to Asia. Well, now with all of the, with the United States banning all the oil in the U European Union last week, saying that they're gonna eventually, I think by this summer, ban all the Russian oil, this is what's gonna happen. You're gonna see all that Russian oil coming out of the West ports are gonna to have to relocate all the way back to the Far East. They're gonna push all the way through the Med, push through there and go all the way over to China, four or five times the distances. Europe is still gonna need oil. They're gonna to have to get it from either the Middle East, which goes through the Mediterranean Sea, takes at least two to three times longer, or they're gonna to have to buy it from the United States or Brazil across the Atlantic. So massive dislocation. It's gonna require a significant amount of tankers. And this is something that we just, we just don't have that many tankers available. So if the EU completely shuts off and bans Russian oil, uh, tankers could go ballistic. This is something really to pay attention to. And finally, I talked about the order book. Nobody's really ordering tankers. We haven't really seen any new tankers ordered since the middle of last year. In fact, early last year was the last time tankers were ordered. And because nobody's ordering them, here's what you have. These two blue lines are your order book, 7% order book. 25% of the fleet is over 15 years old. And once those environmental regulations hit in 2023, anything over 15 is obsolete. So you have these blue ships that are only trading because of sanctions. They're doing stuff like Iran and Venezuela. You have these red ships that are obsolete starting next year with the environmental regulations. And you have only these two tiny bars because 21 is already over. You have these two tiny bars of your order book. So very bullish setup. So real quick, I know we're running low on time. Uh, the top picks in review is Zim Integrated Shipping for containers, Genco Shipping for dry bulk, International Seaways for tankers. And then our overall top value selection, I think is a firm that's well weathered no matter what happens. If the global economy remains strong, this company is gonna do well. They're gonna do a lot of repurchases, pay out big dividends. If the global economy slows, it doesn't really matter because they've already fixed almost their entire fleet out on ranging from seven to 12 year contracts. And that's a company called Textainer Group, TGH. If you've never heard of this company, then I'm doing my job. I'm earning my, earning my keep. What does Textainer Group do? Well, they own the 20 foot and 40 foot metal boxes. They look like this. You've probably seen them. You've probably seen them on the railroads. You've probably seen them in ports. You've seen them on trucks in your streets. They focus on those 20 foot and 40 foot boxes. They're fixed out anywhere from six to seven years up to 10 to 12 years with the major lining companies. They had significant growth rates from 2020 through early 22. Their growth is now done. They've hit the cycle, they maximized it, they pumped all the containers out there and now they're done growing. So now all their free cash flow is going either to dividends or share repurchases. Uh, Tech Standard Group is going to report earnings here in about two to three weeks, and we'll get a latest update on, on where they're allocating their share repurchases and how they're doing there. The reason we like this is because of risk reward. Very low risk, very low exposure, and the majority of the business is fixed for 10 to 12 years. Our fair value estimate of Value Investors Edge is $55 a share, and that was 57% of upside as of the weekend. I think it's up a little bit since we wrote that, so I think the upside is about 52% uh, right now. That is our top overall value, top risk reward. Think about how much money you can make without taking hardly any of the risk. So again, that's a summary. You can follow me on Twitter at Mincemeyer. We have two week research free trials. They're only available. We, we open these up about once per quarter. Uh, so they're only open today and tomorrow, but it's no obligation. You can go to the website, check out our service and uh, just totally zero obligation, two week free trial, Mincemeyer.com. I know we ran a little late. Hopefully we have time for maybe one or two questions. Thanks so much, Jay, for that awesome presentation. So we've got uh, time for one question right here. 
and we'll go with, do you think Zim will do share buybacks before increasing the dividend given how the most recent dividend played out? Hey, that's a great question, million dollar question. Look, I like share repurchases, but I also with a company like Zim, they do a lot of exposure in the spot market. They're earning a ton of money right now in the market. Um, I like to see a company like that returning the cash as it comes in. And I think the, the dividends, I, I would like to see both, right? If, if they ask me, hey, Jamie, inspired, what do you want to do? I would say do both. But I don't really have a huge problem with their dividend. In fact, I think Q1 dividend, their current policy is 20% of net income. I think we're going to see 250 to $3 in this upcoming dividend. We're going to find out pretty soon. We don't have to wait too long. I think mid-May is when they'll do the results. I think we'll see 250 to 3 on the Q1 dividend. And overall for the year, their policy is 30 to 50% income. And I believe they could do 40 in, in sort of the base case, 50 in a bull case. If you say 50% of that is their dividend, I mean, we're talking 20 to $25 in dividends. So pretty phenomenal. I wish they would do both, but I don't know what they're going to do. And if they just do dividends, I'm not going to be complaining. Awesome answer. Well, thank you very much to all of our attendees. Thank you, Jay, for all the great information. We've got a lot more content coming up, so stick around and we'll be back shortly. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.